So I've been kind of playing around with the idea of what would it be to try out vlogging and if I was going to do that, what kind of thing would I vlog about? And I just finished up a neck alley arc that I really had a fun time with and it reminded me of why my own net galley journey began. And that was because of vlog. Specifically, it was because of Christine from the Rumi's Digest, who used to do a regular net galley reading vlog where she'd pick a few titles and check in as she was reading them. Sometimes they were around a theme, sometimes they weren't, but that was really my gateway into the world of net galley. I thought it was for fancy professional book reviewers or influencers. And through her vlogs, I realized that no, anybody can do this and set up my account and then read 50 NetGalley arcs in 2022. So it's all your fault, Christine. But having just finished an arc that I really enjoyed, I thought, you know what, maybe I'll try out doing an homage to Christine's original NetGalley reading vlogs. And I hope, Christine, if you see this, that you see it as the tribute that it is um, because it is done with all the love and respect. Sadly, Christine no longer does these reading vlogs, and I miss them, so I guess I will just pay tribute to them in my own way. So we're going to try that today. Wish me luck! <laughs> So like I said, I actually did just finish a NetGalley arc, so I might as well tell you about the one I just finished. It was inspired by the month of love, even though the book actually doesn't come out until November, and that is Gwen and Art Are Not in Love. Now this is a YA romance set in medieval England, written by Lex Croucher, and the blurb for this said that it was Heartstopper meets A Knight's Tale, which... My geriatric millennial heart got very excited for a Night's Tale reference. And having finished it, such a good time. Really recommend checking it out. It does, however, reflect something that really is bugging me about blurbs when they reference something as being like Heartstopper. Because the only thing that was like Heartstopper about this was that the characters were LGBTQ. That's it. It's a queer book. And I've seen a trend where if there are LGBTQ characters, they compare it to Heartstopper. And I feel like that's really lazy, frankly. But that said, it is very much a queer Knight's Tale vibe, fun time. Basically, you have Gwendolyn and Arthur, Gwen and Art, who are a few hundred years past the reign of Arthur Pendragon. And in this world, King Arthur of the legendary fame is real and his round table was real. But a lot of the magics and systems have been lost to time. And this is the, the world in which we enter. So you have these two who have been promised to each other from childhood, but they hate each other. They've hated each other since childhood. Only now they're turning 18 and the clock is ticking and it's time for them to get married. You have Arthur, who is a notorious rogue, but turns out he's harboring his own secrets. And Gwen, who has very complicated feelings for a young woman who is competing as a knight in the tournament this year. And a whole cast of other secondary characters and chaos ensues from there can't really share more than that but it was a really cute time again it comes out in November in the U.S. but I think it comes out in May in the U.K. definitely check it out Gwen and Art are not in love okay apparently this week is just themed books compared to Heartstopper because the next one that I am picking up is Fake Dates and Mooncakes by Shirley now this is a YA romance that I first heard about because the incomparable Alice Cochran recommended it on her Instagram. And, but honestly, after falling in love with Kiss Her Once For Me and the Charm Offensive in 2022, if Allison tells me to do something, I'm, I'm going to do it. So that's what brought me to Fake Dates and Mooncakes. And this is set in Brooklyn. And it's described as, again, Heartstopper meets Crazy Rich Asians. You have a protagonist who is working in his aunt's Chinese 
restaurant in Brooklyn, and he's about to compete in a mooncake competition for teens. And there's this really attractive guy who keeps hanging out around the restaurant, and he's a distraction. He's a problem. And somehow they end up fake dating to go to this guy's family, a family wedding. That's all I know. Um, yeah, that's all I know so far. So we're going to dive in and see what happens. I'll check in in a little while and let you know what I think. Lilu. Okay, guys, first update. I've hit about the 25% mark for fake dates and mooncakes, and it's getting really cute, and I wanted to let you know about it. Um, so we're basically following Dylan, who lives with his aunt and cousins after his mother died. He lives with them above the Chinese takeaway that his aunt runs that has really high reviews, um, but unfortunately is not super financially viable. And he ends up, through a delivery gone wrong, meeting Theo, who is our Prince Charming, who is New York City elite, essentially. And you could tell, you could tell already, Theo's in it. Theo's feeling it. Theo really is digging what Dylan is throwing out, even though Dylan has no idea he's throwing out anything. And so trying to get to know Dylan, finds out that the business is not doing super well, and sneaky sneaky makes up a whole foundation to give them a grant so that they don't get booted out of the restaurant precious so we've got this whole like prince charming swooping in to save to save the family and he's obviously offended by it and says well i have to pay you back somehow and that turns into you should pretend to be my boyfriend for this family wedding um so there's a whole subplot about a traditional Chinese cooking contest um, that's super, super fun. Now you've got almost the Cinderella-y thing happening and fake dating. And I'm just, I'm having a good time. I, I'm already bracing myself for what I know is going to be a third act breakup. Because um, frankly, they just always exist and we're not getting a miscommunication trope. So obviously we're going to have a... a fake breakup right um it is YA so these boys are definitely like senior year of high school uh but yeah they're real cute I hope I keep vibing it's a good time <laughs> okay till next time So midway point check-in, which I actually hit about 55% last night in bed and realized, crap, I need to go to bed, but also I need to update. I don't want to update them from my bed. So I held. Um, things are getting really interesting. The plot be plotting, and I can't really share much more than that without spoiling said plotting plot. Um, but needless to say, it's still invested, still having a really fun time. I was not expecting to enjoy a contemporary YA romance this much. I tend to avoid them because um, it's been a long time since I've been a teen. Um, like Gwen and Art are in love worked because it was set so far in the past that it didn't really bother me. But this is not bothering me at all. This is this is popcorn. I'm ready for more. Um, I'm going to be sad, I think, when this one's over. At least as of right now, so stay tuned. Okay, guys. I'm a little glassy. I just finished fake dates and mooncakes and it was it was precious. I definitely recommend this. I'm not sure if this is like a four or a five right now. I kind of like to sit on my ratings before giving them um, just to see if I think back on things or if I um, can put the story out of my mind and move on. That kind of helps me uh, land on where I need to be with a rating. But this was so sweet. It had a lot about 
the importance of family connection, um, the importance of tradition, but you also had this through line of this mooncake contest, um, the family's restaurant business, you had Theo's um, struggle to connect with his own father, an adorable corgi puppy running through everything. Like, there were so many good things about this book, and I think something everyone can find in there that's going to be enjoyable. Um, at one point, they even spent some time at the Met in my favorite space in all of New York City. And I just, whether I get to see it in person, on screen, or even on the page, it makes me happy. Um, so that's Fake Dates and Mooncake. I definitely think that if you are a fan of a male-male romance, this is one you're going to want to check out. Alison Cochran did not lead me astray when she recommended this on her Instagram. <laughs> And now for something completely different. Okay, now for something completely different from the sweet little wave romances that I have been reading previously. And we are going to be jumping to a horror uh, that was actually approved for me a while ago and released, released this week and I haven't gotten to it yet. But you know what? Better late than never. So we're going to do Sister Maiden Monster. Um, which is by Lucy Snyder. So from what I understand, this follows three different women who are at the end of the world as our world is being transformed into something terrifying and frankly, Lovecraftian, it seems like. Um, however, this was very heavily inspired by Bram Stoker. So this should be interesting. Um, it kind of gave me vibes of tell me I'm worthless uh which I really really enjoyed and it really kind of terrified me and traumatized me um so I'm hoping I get some of those vibes from this one so we'll see how this one goes it's pretty short it's less than 300 pages uh yeah wish me luck even a quarter of the way into Sister Maiden Monster and it's definitely intriguing. Um, so far we've only been with one woman. Her name is Erin and this is post-COVID-19 but now we are faced with a new pandemic called PVG which they say is like the worst stomach flu you've ever had and we meet her as she's going through her safety procedures and getting home from work because her, her company still hasn't done work from home yet. Um, and her boyfriend has created a beautiful anniversary treat with sushi and wine. And as the night progresses, he proposes and it's exciting. And then she gets sick. She gets very, very sick, violently sick. And the next thing we know, we're far into the future and seeing her talking to a healthcare professional and things are really off, like really off. Her memories are off her body is off. There's something up with her tongue that's kind of terrifying, but I don't know what exactly. And then we flash back to after the hospital, but at a treatment facility post hospital. And they're doing like food testing on her to see how she reacts to things. They're treating her like a physical threat. The government has taken custody of her phone and put monitoring apps on it um so that's where we're at we're not sure what on earth is going on but there are laws passed about people who get this pvg that suspend a lot of their privacy rights and access and healthcare pieces yeah i'm just very intrigued it's it's interesting to say the least there's something going on and i'm sure it's going to be terrifying because i'm already getting little little fingers of creep into into my reading experience. So curious to see how this goes. I know we're supposed to meet other folks, other women as part of this, or at least I thought we were. Maybe we're just following Aaron this whole time, um, but something's up with Aaron. Something's very up with Aaron. 
anyway, I'll check in later, but I just wanted to let you know what was going on so far. It's giving me a sense that there's probably going to be some body horror happening, um, which can be kind of hit or miss for me. But right now, there's not anything that's super grotesque that would be really triggering for folks. Um, as far as I'm concerned, there's not something that's been super triggering for me, with the exception of like pandemic triggers. If you're still somebody who's feeling a lot of anxiety around the pandemic, this could, um, this could really touch on that and agitate that for you. Anyway, I'll check in with you guys later. Okay, remember how I said I thought that this was body horror, but it isn't here yet. It's here now. I'm at the 50% mark. The body horror is here now. Um, yeah, this book is getting really interesting. Okay, so I finished Sister Maiden Monster a little bit ago and I needed a little bit of time to process. Um, I don't read a ton of horror. There was something about this that just really intrigued me. Um, and I'm really glad I picked it up. It was unlike anything I've read recently. It was very Lovecraftian. I would describe this as cosmic horror more than science fiction, which I've seen kind of brandied about. Um, this is more old gods and unknown monsters. Uh, but at its core, this is very much about what it is to be a woman in uncertain times. Uh, there's a lot about bodily autonomy. There's a lot about owning your own destiny, about bonds between women, but with heavy doses of body horror. So it's not for the squeamish by any means. I definitely think that this is going to end up being one of the few five stars I've had so far this year. I feel like I need to genuinely process everything that happened in Sister Maiden Monster before I go diving back into horror. I think Light and Fluffy is going to be my next read or maybe something smutty uh, just to kind of let my brain process and get through everything that happened. So in Sister Maiden Monster, you're actually following three female perspectives across three different parts of the story. And without their knowledge, all three of these women are deeply connected and their fates are deeply intertwined, both with this pandemic situation and even without it, they still would have been intertwined. Um, so it's really fascinating to watch their relationships unfold, to see how they interact with the world um, and how the world is quite frankly crumbling down around them. This is definitely an end of the world story, the birth of a new world. This is dark. This is fascinating. It is beautifully grotesque is I think the only way I can really describe it. So this came out literally last week. It's on shelves. Go pick it up if, if you are not squeamish. Uh, but definitely worth a read. So those are the three books of this Net Galley reading vlog. I'm going to put them all over here. We had a little, why is everything compared to Heartstopper? Because they think that's going to help sell it moment with our first two and then a complete derailing with extreme body horror <laughs> with the last. Um, but really, you know what? That's kind of how my vibe was this week of how I wanted to be reading. But I really enjoyed getting to kind of share my thoughts as I was going through. Um, so if you liked this experience, if you want to see more of this type of content, please go ahead and hit that like button. If you're not already and you want to see more from me, you can hit that subscribe button. I'm trying to post once a week and so far it's been working. So yay! <laughs> Um, you can connect with me on all my socials, including Goodreads and Storygraph. I've got everything linked down below. I've also linked the incredible Rumi's Digest duo because Christine is the reason that I even thought to do this type of video. Um, and while she is no longer doing NetGalley reading vlogs, there are still some on her channel that are amazing. Even though the books are already out, I highly recommend probably some of my favorite vlog content out there. And that's all I got for you today. So until next time, bye guys.